I'll just do this. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I'm Ann Elgood. I am the Good Works Executive Director of ICA LA, and I'm just so pleased to invite you here this afternoon and welcome you to the opening of our fall exhibitions. It does not feel like fall out there. It feels like summer, but indeed, this is fall in LA. Um, we are going to have a, a conversation here between Janelle Porter and Barbara T. Smith, which I know you're all very much looking forward to. I just want to mention the other exhibition that's in our project room called Infinite Rehearsal. Infinite Rehearsal was really born out of thinking about performance art, artists who work with movement, with live action, and how ICALA can continue to support those kinds of artists and their practices, which tend to offer different kinds of challenges for institutions than others. And in the context of Barbara's show, in which we wanted to celebrate her as the pioneer of performance art that she is, but also an object maker, which you're going to hear a lot about momentarily, we wanted to think about who were some other artists living and working in LA who could be shown alongside Barbara's show, and not necessarily with the idea that they would be showing finished works or have the pressure of a sort of short run of a, a finished piece at the institution. And so what we devised, um, Amanda Sroka, our senior curator, um, along with Chris Emil, came up with this idea of an infinite rehearsal space. So we have turned our project room into a uh, sprung floor with Marley, um, everything that artists working in movement and dance need in order to, to keep their bodies safe. And there are a group of artists from, um, that are in Chris's orbit that are going to be rehearsing and creating new work and trying things out and maybe failing at things and trying again in that space over the course of the next four months. So we're really excited to have these artists essentially um, in residence with us and working live in front of all of you, hopefully. So please come back many times to see what they're up to, what they're doing. We heard from each of them yesterday a little descriptions of what they're working on, and it's all very exciting and quite inspiring. Um, at 5 o'clock or whenever this conversation is done, Chris will be in the space doing some kind of workshop. Um, I don't know what it's going to be, but I know you're all invited to go in there to participate if you feel so inclined or just to observe. Um, so I also want to also point out that Christine's son, Kim, has a mural on our outdoor wall. This is a rotating ser series of murals that we do on the space, and that has been here for a few months and will be on view here until early next year. So please check that out if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Oscar Hisa here in a second to do a little housekeeping and introduce our speakers, but I just want to say again, and some of you have heard this from me over the last couple of days, we are really, really honored to be presenting Barbara T. Smith's first comprehensive museum survey. This is 60 years of work. Um, the woman has made a lot of work in that time, and it's so exciting to see it on view. Janelle Porter, who has worked side by side with Barbara over many, many months, has just done an incredible job of bringing this very diverse, very eclectic practice into focus for us. And I know you, you're going to see things that you're familiar with. You're going to see things you never knew Barbara made. There are discoveries around every corner, and it's a lot of material. So these two are going to give us some highlights. But I just encourage you to spend as much time as you can in the galleries, and please do come back. Everything we do at ICLA is free. It's open to all. So come, come again. Come as often as you want. We're always here. We love having you join us. So please come back. And I will now turn it over to Oscar. Thanks, Anne. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Oscar Hisa. I am the Director of Learning and Engagement. And as you heard, we have an extraordinary exhibition at ICLA about artist Barbara T. Smith. The work is singular, powerful, my favorite, funny. <laughs> and the show is remarkable because it is so comprehensive, building on the year of Barbara. <laughs> yes. 
And not only that, for its presentation of historical pioneering work in performance, an art form that is known to be ephemeral, the show is extremely lively and present in its comprehensiveness. So huge kudos to both Barbara and our guest curator, Janelle Porter. <laughs> so we're about to be in, we are about to be in some rare air with the conversation between Barbara and Janelle. And I tend to refrain from reading full bios. They're on your seats. They look like this. They're your souvenirs. Barbara really needs no introduction. And you are about to learn about Barbara from Barbara. And since, but since the, you know, since the 1960s, Barbara T. Smith's work has demonstrated an engagement with issues of spirituality, gender, and power, making vital contributions to both feminist discourse and performance art as it developed on the West Coast. Janelle Porter is a curator, writer, editor, research warrior, and now newly minted scholar of Barbara T. Smith. She most recently organized K. Sekimachi geometries for the Berkeley Art Museum, Less is a Bore, Maximalist Art and Design for the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, and Mike Kelly, Timeless Painting for, timeless painting for the Mike Kelly Foundation at Hauser & Wirth, New York. She is currently co-editing an indigenous present with artist Jeffrey Gibson and a monograph on Viola Frey in 2024. We're going to try to keep this convo really tight, like an hour, um, and we'll try to accommodate a couple of questions at the end. Of course, if you have a burning question, we will try to accommodate you. I know Janelle's a really good timekeeper, but there is a lot more programming to this day, the celebratory day. In our project room space, we have Infinite Rehearsal, Chris Emil, and No One Art House co-organized by Chris Emile and ICLA senior curator Amanda Sroka with Caroline Ellen Liu, ICLA curatorial assistant. This is ICLA continuing to invite the possibilities and dynamics of process as presentation. Joining this process, uh, joining this project are the artists of No One Art House, an oscillating collective of artists who range across disciplines rooted in performance. Infinite rehearsal artists are Chris Emile, Shauna Davis, Marcella Lewis, Cody Perkins, Quenga, Jordan Slafly, and Jobel Medina. Special shout out to Shauna Latif, our Getty Marrow intern, who I know is in the audience, for assisting with infinite rehearsal. Like most exhibitions, this project emerged from deep conversations between the artist and the curator and in this case, Chris Emile and Amanda Sroka, respectively. Based in Los Angeles, Chris Emile is an active director, choreographer, educator, and performer. Chris's directorial and choreographic work oscillates between the experiential, film, stage, and commercial worlds. To kick off uh, the infinite rehearsal project today, Chris Emile will lead a free movement workshop. I think I heard the word improv, too. And that'll happen at the end of this conversation, but it's scheduled for 5 to 6 p.m. in the project room space right over there. Um, all levels are welcome. Uh, <laughs> or you may simply just watch and enjoy the class. Enjoy everything. Also beginning at 5 p.m., artist Cody Perkins, a.k.a. Algorithm Not Dot code will be DJing and providing sublime sounds outside until 7 p.m. Hopefully it doesn't stay so hot. <laughs> After the class, the project room will be restored to the ghost setting, a quiet state with a single theatrical light on, so the dancers and you, our guests, friends, supporters of ICALA, can hang out and enjoy the energy of the rehearsal space. Lastly, I want to point out another project in our um, museum that's opening today, and that's in this area here. We have... Um, a lot of activity happens on our bookshelves, and we usually have a bookshelf residency where we have book publishers and booksellers, independent and small press, occupy our shelves rather than us trying to run a bookstore. Um, however, in this fall, we do have a special project with our 
ICLA Agency of Assets Youth Fellows, and this is, these are 12 youth fellows who have been with us for several months, uh, learning the creative arts sector, actually having full-time jobs in the creative sector, whether that be nonprofit or for-profit, and it always culminates with an exhibition. So that's Data Beta, The Labor of Looking, which they have created in collaboration with artists York Chang and Tatiana Vaughn. So some of the youth will be here today. It's their opening day too, so please enjoy that exhibition. Uh, we like to describe ICALA as a place to gather, learn, and transform with artists and with each other. So thank you for coming. Thanks, Asuka. Um, thanks, everybody, for being with us. Now we're going to get to the, the meat of it, Barbara. Are you ready? First of all, first off, I want to thank everybody at the ICA, and I had full thanks, but let, let's get to it. Um, um, I do want to thank the many curators, art historians, and writers whose work on and about Barbara since the 1960s has made my research possible. Yeah. And I can't do my job as a curator unless there are essays and images and lists. And I thank Barbara for being the best archivist of her own work <laughs> um, and for saving everything, uh, for saving everything, which is what you do when your life is your art. And um, I'd also like to thank Mar McCarthy at The Box for bringing Smith's work back into view in 2007 and to Glenn Phillips and Pietro Rigolo at the Getty Research Institute for holding Barbara's archives since 19, oh, excuse me, since 2014. And I thank you, Barbara, for allowing me to open every drawer and box in your home studio. <laughs> at one point, she remarked that I was very thorough, and I sort of took it as a compliment, but she was definitely just making a comment. <laughs> <laughs> So, thank you. And so we're just going to sit together on this nice, sultry afternoon and, and get to know you. And we're going to end by five, as everybody has said. And, but I thought we should just start, you know, in 1931. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 1931, Barbara T. Smith is born. So, um, but the greatest pleasure that I have as a curator is spending time with artists. And so today you all get to do that. Barbara, um, when you were a child... Did you make art? Uh-uh. <laughs> well, <clears throat> in the summers, um, I would, um, with my best friend who lived across the street, the two of us would make paper dolls. You know, we had a, a, a paper doll, and then we made all her dresses and things. That's one thing we did. And then in grammar school, um, I did drawings. I think I still have a couple of them from some of the... Uh, things we were studying, I don't know about Indians or <laughs> I don't know what it was, but yeah, a little bit, but I, I, it was just what you did in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't think of it as art, really. But you took uh, some classes at the Pasadena Art Museum, oh, yeah. I, I believe I recall you telling me, because you were a pretty precocious kid. And your parents enrolled you in some art classes at the museum. That's true. That uh, Pasadena Art Museum had uh, weekend classes for kids to come and um, paint. And, and they had a person who would model. And uh, I have a drawing of, you know, a guy whose face I drew. Anyway, um, the main thing was that this woman who was the teacher. She was this great big German woman and, and uh, you know, because the whole museum had been uh, selected as the Gulkeshire repository of the Gulkeshire collection, German uh, um, historian's collection of, of, um, of expressionist work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, she, so this woman, I don't know who she was, but she had just terrible B.O. <laughs> <laughs> and so you'd sit and you'd, and then you'd see her coming towards you and you'd try to hope that she never got very close. It was, it was very funny. So despite that early remarkable experience, you still, you still at some point decided to pursue being an artist. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about 
what what that looked like for you at that time and when it happened. Well, I was we were living in Georgia. I was married by that time, and I had my son Rick already. And so Alan would have to, you know, get up at five in the morning and go to the camp and participate as a soldier. And, yeah, this and is in I, the early 1950s during the Korean War. Yeah, and, and I then had all day in my little bungalow house that we had to do basically nothing. And, you know, I'd go buy food and stuff like that. But, um, <clears throat> and so I kept thinking about it, you know, I had all this training as an artist in college and so forth. And, well, I should just do what I was trained to do, which be as an artist. That's how it came up. So Alan and I went for a walk in the forest, and I was saying, hey, you know what? I'm, I've decided something. I know what I want to do. And he says, what? And I said, I'm going to start making paintings. And, and, <laughs> and he thought, well, OK. But what I really meant was, I must be an artist, you know, as a, as a profession. Yeah. And so that's the early 1950s. You come back to Southern California, to Pasadena. And so by the early 1960s, you're in your 30s. You have three kids. You're married. You're probably making some art. But tell us a little bit about what's going on in your life in the 1960s. You're volunteering at the Pasadena Art Museum. You're starting to meet artists and be part of a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I was in therapy um, for a few years, actually. And part of one of my breakthrough ex things was, I'm going to volunteer at the Pasadena Art Museum, which was this liberating. He said, oh, great. You know, he was so thrilled that I did that. Anyway, so w when I went and volunteered, um, they had, let's see, Tom Levitt was the director of the museum at the time, and then shortly they also hired Walter Hopps, who is legendary as a great um, curator, museum director of very avant-garde art, you know, that no one else even knew about. And so I was working there uh, maybe once or twice a week, and, and so then they showed, uh, well, a, a, a retrospective of Marcel Duchamp, and I m met Marcel Duchamp, and they did <clears throat> a, a thorough, um, ex what is it, exploration of abstract expressionist art, which was the big thing at the time in New York, and they came out to California, at, I mean, the artworks did, and then pop art, which was starting to happen. And um, so in that process, the pop art show in particular brought a lot of um, LA artists into the scene. And so they would hung out. That was a great museum in the sense that artists could just hang out there mm. and, and sit around and talk and all, which doesn't seem to happen anywhere else. And, and so Anyway, I got to know, you know, Ed Ruscha and um, Joe, Joe Good, and anyway, and I also went back to Chenard for a year because I had all these really what I thought were innovative ideas, but I was thinking maybe I'm self-deceived because I haven't been around other artists for a long time. So I went to Chenard to sort of compare myself with other artists graduating to see if I was in, in the ballpark, so to speak, and, and, and I was. But at the same time, so I got to know Joe Good in particular. He was very, um, we'd have long conversations about art and, you know, it's, it's very, very stimulating. Mm -hmm. And that was about 1965, you went back to school. And um, sort of shortly thereafter, um, so you're painting at the time, and I'm gonna sort of skip us forward a bit. In 1966, you embark on what would become a sort of lifelong exploration of technology and certain different technologies and artwork, which serves sort of spots through your work, which you'll be able to see in the exhibition. But the first thing was that you um, rented a Xerox machine. You leased a Xerox machine, which was a then new technology. Barbara, um, 
Do you want to start us off on? Oh, well, the, yeah. it, <clears throat> the way it sounds like is that I'm sitting there trying to think about all these new technologies I could fool around with, but that's not at all the way it was. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I just wanted to Break make, it down for us. <laughs> I, it happened. I uh, see, for the Xerox thing, I wanted to make a print. I went to Gemini, which had just opened, and I proposed this print I wanted to do, and they just kind of shoved it, me off because I didn't have a gallery. In other words, I was completely unknown. And so it was, for me, it was, uh, it was, um, you know, like I was very, I realized I was being um, shined on, you know, so as I was driving home, I was just furious. And I was thinking, well, you know, um, in each epoch, there's a um, technology that becomes, it's a, it's a printmaking technology which is devoted to passing information to the public in different ways, like say etchings and engravings and lithography. But those are all the mediums of the past. What is the medium of our time? And so I thought, the business machine. So then I started researching business machines to see if one of them was actually a new technology. Because um, a lot of business machines, the technology is basically the same as a lithograph, actually. But, but, the, um, but the Xerox machine is completely unique. It has the, um, the medium is not ink, but it's plastic, little plastic beads of plastic and then and then uh, the paper the the object you're going to d duplicate is on the glass and it, it, it's electronically charged to for this these little toner beads to re replicate exactly what was above them and then um, as it goes through the process then it goes through a centering process which is heating them and 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 then the little bead of glass melts and 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 bonds with the paper and comes out so that's completely different technology so i i leased a, a, a xerox machine and i put it in my dining room mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so it, you put it in your dining room and you kept it for about eight months and during that time you made something like 50,000 copies. Probably. <laughs> and I actually know that because, thank God for the Getty Archives, there's a receipt from the lease, and it says the count when she received the machine and when it was returned. Yeah. And you made sort of all manner of work. You oh, took amazing. these Xeroxes and made sculpture, poetry sets. You made collages. You're going to see a huge um, array of them in the first main room of the show. But you often did describe uh, your relationship with the machine as quite intimate. <laughs> uh, and it's not only because of how well you knew how to use the machine mm -hmm. and all the things that it could do mm -hmm. and when it might catch fire, yeah. uh, for example, uh, but also what you could do on the machine with your own body, mm -hmm. which we have not talked about yet for a public audience. <laughs> but <laughs> well, just... tell us about that. You know, I mean, it, it could um, replicate almost anything you put on it. And it was, I mean, it was just endless. I felt, I, I didn't even know how I would ever stop using it because it kept having, indicating new and new ideas. And, and I'd find, oh, this would look weird, you know, and put that on the machine. Well, the other option, of course, is putting your body on the machine. And I did things with my hands and, 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 Lo and behold, <laughs> the, this being the 60s, you have to figure the, that it became really a good idea to put my naked body on the machine in, in different ways, which I did. And, 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 and I tried to convince my husband <laughs> to join me in this escapade. <laughs> but he was a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so these, some of these, uh, and the way that these works were presented, not that they were presented at that, at that time to a public, but the way they were presented was that they were often compiled in books. 
So you actually created also with this quite intimate work an intimate viewing experience where it's held in the hand and requires a viewer's active participation uh -huh. to look through it. Right. Yeah. Right. And and then and, and because at first I had all these piles of and what are they? What am I doing? You know, and then I thought, oh yeah, well that could be a that idea could be a book and then uh, and and others are just simple prints, but and then I had to research how you get books of this sort bound, and I went to different bookbinders and found, uh, had a couple trial books made, but then um, most of them were done with a particular bookbinder, which I can't even think of his name anymore. We could probably find it, but There's anyway. a receipt, I'm sure, and it's in the archive. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and so, um, and then the idea was what, would these people, what was, what were these about or something? And I, and I formulated a logo, which is a, a circle with a cross inside. It's just all in silver. And it was stamped on the cover of the books. And they, I thought of these books as coffins and God knows why, but at the same time, my marriage was coming to an end and I'm the daughter of a mortician, so <laughs> my mind kind of thinks in terms of, of doing something about death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you, the way that you figured out how to stop was that you just called the leasing company and said, come pick, the, pick yeah, this well, up. Yeah, well, I asked Alan, my husband, I said, how am I ever going to stop this? And he says, just call them up and tell them to get the machine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't... It, Pretty simple. I think what can't be overstated is really how radical it was to make artwork on a Xerox machine at that time. Really, mm -hmm. there weren't, there were a couple of other artists who were using it, but nowhere near the way that Barbara made artwork with this machine. Yeah. And even some other artists that came along later and really used the machine was not until into the late 1970s. So um, I'm just constantly amazed by, by that, by the fact that you, that you sort of formulated why you were going to use it and then what you did with it and how much work that you actually made. And then all of that work was sort of put away. It wasn't shown. It didn't become famous. And it wasn't until Mara McCarthy showed it at the box that it sort of started creeping back into public view. And we started to recognize you as an artist who had made this profoundly radical body of work with mm -hmm. a machine. Uh -huh. So um, put an exclamation point on that and we'll move on to, to talk about your work field piece which um, is presented in the exhibition in various forms. But in 1969, you instigated a very ambitious sculptural environment. Mm. And I will get you started talking about how it was made, because I'm still learning all of the terms. But how this work was made, this sculpture that was composed of 180 fiberglass blades of grass that were nine and a half feet tall and uh, the environment had sound and light that was touch activated. Uh -huh, by walking through by it. By walking through it. Yeah, because they had ribbon switches that were underneath the flooring and it was programmed and went through, um, you know, to a console over here which had the circuit boards, which you'll see in the show that then could be um, programmed to do many different things, but in this case, it was programmed to turn on the light near where you were standing and also the sound, and the sound was a drone sound made by a synthesizer mm -hmm. uh, program. And so, uh, what were you asking? How did you figure out how how did all that come together in terms of the wiring and the circuitry? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, because well, again, it was sort of there wasn't anybody doing anything like that. I don't know. It just it started building this thing, and it, it had its own demands. In other words, first was to decide what whether to do it or not. Well, the reason I decided to do it was I was just recently divorced, so I had a hunk of money that I could spend, which I never had that much money again. 
So, so I Nor had, did you have it for very long. Oh, no, I just kept going out the door. But okay, so and then I was down at Irvine, and I had a studio, and it had you know I had a, um, a spray booth, and I had all the space and stuff to, to, that was safe to build it in, and then. Um, so, uh, well, you went back to school. She went back to graduate school at UCI. She was, um, Barbara, you were in really one of the, f the first mm. class of the new master's program there, the MFA. And some of the, the others that you were in school with were Chris Burden and Nancy Buchanan. So it's really like a history that, you know, we California fans really know how important this program was. And you were there, mm -hmm. but you weren't. 23, <laughs> no. you were in your late 30s, yes, recently yeah. divorced with three kids, and you sort of start school, and you're going to, like, I'm in the middle of this sculpture uh -huh. environment, uh -huh. and I'm going to keep making it, and you spent every cent you had mm -hmm. to make it, mm -hmm. and showed it just after you finished your MFA in 1971. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> School, I got all the facts. <laughs> in 1971. And what was this piece like to experience? What did it feel like? What did it... Oh, it was great. Like? It was, I mean, was anybody here who ever saw it? No, probably not. Did you go through it? Not the first time. Well, it's, it was... Um, you know, it was daunting. I mean, the reason that I built it so big was the idea was that, um, okay, so I had, I had a, unbeknownst to me, I had a lot of pressure on me uh, to be perfect, right, to do everything just perfect. And, and out of that, out of that came, <laughs> <laughs> came, came these black glass paintings, and, and they had to be perfect. You know, you couldn't have a bit of lint or anything in that it was just, and and finally when I finished and got them all together and then they were shown to a, a art alliance group that came to and I realized they'd never in the world understand those paintings and it just pissed me off I worked so hard for nothing and 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 so uh, I was standing there furious and started throwing this rasp at a piece of glass that was a test piece of glass and breaking it and as I was breaking this um, I had this um, what would we call it um, like a vision a vision of epiphany that and first it was it was Julie you will live forever that was my daughter Julie and then I saw this field of of blades of grass, exactly like I made it, and and so um, so and it was like I you know I'm so tired of trying to be perfect. All I want to do is is be like everybody else and just everyone's equal under the sun. Nobody's more special than anybody else, and and so that was sort of the inner experience. And so then, gradually, I, it was a lot of technological. It took a year to figure out how to build those big blades because they could have been in a mold that would, you know, be a fem fem female mold. But then, not only would it's so tall, the the seam would be tend to be wavy, and it, you know, it just wouldn't work. So, eventually, then we had to figure out how do we we got molds made, and then how do we get the, the piece to come off the mold? It took, took oh, forever to learn how to get all of that. Anyway, so it's, it's, the process of getting it started and into a working process took almost as long as it did to build it. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, it took two days at least to build each one of those. So it's a, it was big. And... And then it all had to be engineered together so that it would work. And it was shown a couple of times. And then finally it was damaged and was put in the garbage, essentially. Well, but before it was put in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because <clears throat> some people got inside when it was at Long Beach and broke down a lot of the 
pieces. It was a long story, but then he, then I, I didn't have anywhere to store it. I mean, how do you store something like that? And so um, I decided, I'd, at first I tried to sell some of the blades, but no one would buy one. And then, I mean, a couple. And then, and then I decided to give them away. So I went around secretly taking these things and giving them to, in pe people's backyards or up on the top of a hill. Or, or like in front of some stores. Just, yeah, they're just planting these blades there. And there's pictures in the show, of Barbara, there's like a truck full of cement. So you didn't just like leave them there, you guys. But dug a hole, poured cement, and stuck the blade in it. <laughs> well, like a big F you to the... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and is Sean still here? I think he left. But anyway, Sean Millant, he showed the whole field piece the, the very first time he had. Yeah, at Sirius. And his gallery uh, was a great big space about like this, you know, that for some reason I got to do it there. But then um, after that, so I, I, I planted one of the blades in front of the Cirrus place yeah yeah different in, in the gallery in well everywhere as you can imagine <laughs> so i'm going to move us forward in time um so in 1969 you make your first performances did i yeah, yeah you did and uh and at that time performance art was not you know the genre that we know it today it was not a word a term art term that was being it wasn't it didn't have a name yeah what were some of the things that led you to pursue performance beginning in 1969? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I, I had already done this funny little thing with my children. I took, um, they were being babysat at a friend's house, and we went to pick them up. And so I made up my face sort of a little bit strange. And then we went to pick them up. And and um, and they said, they, they you know like Julie said, who are you? They said, I said I don't know. Who, who do you think I am? And she says, I think you're God. <laughs> and then I went to her uh, and to the kids that the, the, the place where they were staying. The same thing happened. This little boy, he says you know, who are you? And I said, who do you think I am? He says, I don't know. I think you're God. It was really amazing. And, and, and so then I said, well, um, he had a, a doll's house and it, it was, he said that it's on fire and everybody's going to die. And he says, well, I said, isn't anybody going to save them? And he said, I'll save them. And he went and pulled, pulled and, and I said, told him he was so brave <laughs> anyway the whole thing you know and and um so it got you thinking about that was uh, you know becoming somebody other than i normally am and so then uh when i got divorced there was a workshop that was taught in um at the Duan Gallery by Alex Hay, who was a New York dancer, you know, one of the innovative dancers. And because I knew I'd be building this big sculpture forever, I decided to go to the workshop. And we'd go once a week and we'd invent, we did these pieces that became, that were, well, I, I did, and then we did, a, we did a performance. This is probably the very first performance event in LA at the old LA Conservatory of Music, which is no longer there. But, and, and so I did three pieces in that evening and others did, it was a, and Judy Chicago was there and she came up to me after me, she just told me how great it was and we should do something together or something. And we, which we did, but, um, <clears throat> um, so that was the beginning of this, these actions. And, and then I was invited to, Stanley Grinstein invited me out to lunch. And he said, well, we, I've been watching what you've been doing. And he says, do you, I'd like to know what else you'd like to do, because we'd like to help you. And I told him about the ritual meal, which was a dinner, strange 
seven or eight course dinner at their, and they said, okay, we'll do that. We'll, and so they funded that whole thing, which was enormously complicated. Dinner, it was wonderful. It was very, very, very magic. It's hard, to, I have too much to explain. Yeah, I, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was one of the first major performances that you did in 1969 called Ritual Meal, as Barbara said. And it was, um, what I think is sort of remarkable about that piece is that you have said at one point that, you know, as a certain, a woman raised a certain way, you were sort of raised to make dinner parties. Mm. That's what you were taught to do as a wife and mother. And one of your first performances was this kind of dinner, but it was a very um, <laughs> turned upside down dinner party right. where um, uh, guests were given uh, strange things to eat. They didn't know what they were. They were given Bunsen burners to, to cook their own food over. They were uh, made somewhat neutral looking with um, white surgical gowns and hats. But, and that was an extraordinary work and very important. Then a few years pass, and I, th I think um, this is the last thing that we might talk about today. You make v one of the most powerful and important pieces that has ever been made of performance art called Feed Me. Mm. You make in 1973. Mm. And you're, you're finished school. You're just sort of launching yourself as an artist who will be working in the genre of performance art in focusing on the body. Tell us what Feed Me was. Tell us a little bit about how it came to be. <laughs> well, um, let's see. I had just been um, musing about, you know, what I might do next. And I began to have this idea. Um, it was hardly, barely formulated. It was like... I was very tired of um, going everywhere as a single woman and, and always being hustled by men. It just pissed me off. They could, there's no other way that someone wanted to make friends with me except as a sexual object. And it just, I was so pissed. So I, uh, Tom Marioni, I don't know if you all know who he is, but he was the, uh, another early performance person. And he had a space in San Francisco called the Museum of Con uh, Concept Conceptual, Conceptual Art. Art. Right. And I happened to see him here. And I, he said, what are you doing these days? And I told him I had this idea of um, being in this room. Anyway, I described the piece. And he says, that's perfect. You come up and you can do it in a week up here, up at um, uh, was MOCA, it was called Museum of Conceptual Art. And so um, I did. I went up there, and uh, what he had was a, a, a um, what used to is an old big industrial building, um, which possibly had had a big print presses in it or something. Anyway, and so it has the eve, the whole thing that whole night was called all night sculptures, and there were performances that were happening and other kinds of installation kinds of things all night long that night. So was, I wasn't the only person doing something. But in my case, I had uh, the women's uh, lavatory, restroom. It's, it's one that, it's, you know, this is 19th century or 20, early 20th century. It was a, a, a fairly big room. It had a little tiny wash basin and a toilet behind a door and the rest was just an empty space. It had some benches around, and, and, and it must have been where women came to... Um, take a break, or... Get, they would be... Maybe take a rest. Be getting vapors, you know. It was, it was, I mean, this whole thing of <laughs> protecting women. Women can't do the same. Anyway, so, so, so there was this um, mattress on the floor, and it was covered with an oriental rug, and then I put around the room on these benches all these different ways that you could interact other than sex. So, so there was like um, massage oils, there was food, there was wine, there was coffee and tea, there were books to read, there was all, you know, and so, and they went all around the room. So anyway, 
The piece was that a, one person at a time would come in and... Um, and, and there was I a recording. Would, there was a recording of your voice saying, feed me, feed yes, me. My voice was saying over and over again, feed me. And you were... Feed me. And I was naked and I was sitting on this mattress thing. And, and so uh, these people, these guys would come in and they were <laughs> kind of, most, it was all men, all, like 18 people, three were women, all the rest were men. They came in and they were just kind of dumbfounded. I mean, they didn't, you know, they had probably one thing in mind and they were confronted with, first of all, you have to figure out what it's about. Secondly, make some decision about what you want to do. And, th <laughs> and and three, ask me if you ever, you know, such an unlikely thing, ask me what I, w if, if I would like to have a massage or would you like some wine or whatever. And, and so they, they all did, you know, they finally, get, sometimes they get it very quickly and other times it took a while. But anyway, they get this idea, would you like a glass of wine? And I would say, yes. And so the guy would get up and go get some wine. And then he'd sit and start talking to me and forget to hand it to me, which is, <laughs> that was really funny. But <laughs> you said that happened several times. No, well, kind of. <laughs> and, and, and also, um, but the, you know, I, one guy gave me massages and uh, it was all kinds of really fun interactions that were, deliberate decisions based on him asking if I would want that. And so, but of course, the rumor went around was that I was sleeping with every single man that came in. <laughs> and it wasn't, of course, true. It was, it was a, a... Not every man. No, no, it was, it was a contradiction. I, mean, I, was, I was contradicting the 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 yeah. usual story. And you were putting yourself in a situation where you were in control I, of was. the situation as opposed to some other performances that were um, uh, in the air at the same time by women performance artists that had... Oh, um, Valley Export was one, but yeah. her, her you know, she had control, I'm trying to think. Of. Marina Abramovich. Abramovich. Yeah. Yeah. And hers were, well, not as erotic yeah. as... Dangerous, though. Because, dangerous. Yeah. And a lot of people thought that what you did was dangerous, mm -hmm. and that it set back feminism 20 years. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Beverly Richards. It's not actually funny, so I don't know why I'm laughing, but it was. <laughs> you didn't. We don't think. <laughs> So it was an extraordinary performance, and, and I think probably somewhat more mythical for the fact that only 18 people actually know what happened. Know what happened, that it was a performance for one person at a time. And you've made works that are for large audiences and for one-at-a-time audiences and for no audiences mm -hmm. in your career. Um, so, Barbara, I'm going to... Um, super, super looking at my watch, and I wish we had all afternoon... Um, but of course we do not, and we want to say hi to everybody. But I want to say that's just the beginning of the show. There is much more to see, and I want to, um, if I may, read a couple of things that you have written that I find extraordinary. Um, one, we're making a catalog of the show, which will come out later uh, during the run of the show, and we're reprinting this text, this essay that you wrote for a performance art journal called of what, of what Use Are They, Women in Industry? And it, I love this text because it gives the flavor of Barbara's incredible sense of humor. And so she's writing about working, of course, because in the 70s she had to make a living, so she had a bunch of horrible jobs. You worked in, like, a plastics factory, you worked at Hamburger Hamlet, etc. Yeah, they weren't, yeah. they weren't terrible, but I wouldn't want to do them for a lifetime. Right, right. Yeah. So you write this, uh, this essay, and it's like, so I went to work in an office. I learned their elaborate system to keep things in order so as not to lose anything. So she writes out about filing things. The, um, you know, here's the phone, this is what you do, this is who you call, the pinks go here, the blues go here, etc. And then, right, so I decided it was a very good idea to fuck up the system.
File the pinks in blue, Adams under Arco, and Arco in Bentley. Bentley in chrome plastic, chrome plastic under to be build. Reddy's under not, and so on. You get the picture? <laughs> then there was the gum and candy setup and the coffee break teas, the tinsy rewards for such crashing boredom, and it taught me about cigarette smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so I phoned my friends and they started calling me at work. I did a flourishing business on the side. I came in late and dressed bizarrely. I really, really love that. And then I want to just um, end with something a little bit more um, apropos for our day today. In 1991, you said, I believe that artists are transformers, literal transformers in our body. We go to places that are falling down, and by putting a new spark of energy there, we regenerate that place so that it will rise again. We actually bring the life force back. That's why it is so important to keep art viable. We are tamers and rabble-rousers. We kick the dust up, and we also can quiet the spirit and keep it going. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, Janelle. Oh, sorry, Oscar. Excuse me. Go ahead. We might have time for one or two. What? Questions. Okay. Better be good. Better than Anne has one. No. Does, does anyone want to ask a question? I mean, is that what we want to do? You can. Can you guys tell that I don't like questions from the audience? <laughs> it's up to you. We could just go into the show. <laughs> yes, Caroline. Oh, Caroline here. I would love to hear more about the synthesizer drone that was in, in the blades of grass. The what? She would love to hear more about the synthesizer drone that was in the blades of grass. And your relation to synthesizers oh, and Molly. sound. Oh, let's see. Um, Mike. Um, I, uh, I, had, uh, I was friends with Joseph Bird, and Joseph Bird is an early... Uh, composer of, of work on synthesizers. And he, he actually, he played the synthesizer all the, during, like say the ritual meal dinner that I did and so forth. We were good friends. And so um, I was building this big sculpture and I, the kind of sound it needed to make was uh, drone-like, not percussive. And so, um, he said, well, yeah, well, when you're ready, I'll help you do that. And so he did. Okay. It's five o'clock. We need to do some dancing. <laughs> exactly. okay. so, Again, thank, thank you. Thank you. And party and celebrate. Thank you, everyone.